Hi everybody, welcome to our first chapter in the introduction to statistics. And that is Site 218 Analysis of Behavioral Data. Today we're going to look at chapter 1, the introduction. So we have five learning outcomes for this chapter, and they are number one. Hmm, there we go. We're going to define key statistical terms, key terms in statistics that we use. What is statistics? How do we do statistics? And what do we use to do those things? We're going to look at some of those terms. Two, we're going to define some key measurement terms. Because we are assuming that people are different, just like you and me and your classmates, and when we are asked the same question, we would have different responses. We're going to measure those responses. And so we're going to look at some of those terms. Three, we're going to look at key research terms. What sort of questions will we ask about people? And if you have taken other classes, one of the ways that we can describe psychology is the question, how do people study people? And so research helps us ask those questions and statistics help us measure our answers to those questions. Number four, we're going to describe the place of statistics in science. Where does statistics come in in the scientific method? What do we do with all this math? How do we answer questions with math? And so this chapter will cover those things. And finally, because we are measuring different people, and we are including the results of different people's responses to questions, we're going to do some adding up along with some other steps. So we're going to talk about some math as well that is needed for us to do statistical research. In terms of the math required for this class, you're going to need some basic math skills. And these basic math skills are the minimum grade 11 math. So there is a algebra skills test that is going to be done at the first thing in this course that would help you and me figure out where you stand with your math. You, some of you may already have like calculus one, two, and math is no problem for you. That's great, one last thing. Some of you might not have that math yet, and so if you know you don't have that math and this test confirms that, um, like this slide says here, if you need to catch up on your math skills, uh, then you need to catch up right away because if you don't, there's a very big risk um, in this course, either by not performing as well as you'd like or expect or be very, very, very tempted to cheat and we can catch that as well. So make sure you catch up that math skill and there's, you can have the whole semester to do it and we have resources for you. So then you would put yourself in a much better situation. So again, completing the math skills assessment would determine, help you figure out where you are now. So let's begin. Statistics, science, and observations. There are two meanings to the word statistics. And the first meaning we're going to look at is the idea that statistics is a way of doing things. It's a way of measuring people and measuring their behavior. So as in this point says, statistics means statistical procedures. Procedures is a way of doing things, a systemized, systematic, organized way of measuring things. So here we can use statistics to organize and summarize behavioral data. So this could be anything from how are you performing in your classes? Those would be your percentages and grades. What's your body temperature? How much time do you spend sleeping? Those are behavioral data because we are people and we have behavior, things that we can do and things people can observe. We can also determine what conclusions about this data we can make. For example, uh, we can safely assume some things like if a class of 35, for example, takes this class, the average grade for the class would be somewhere between 50 to 65. Uh, we can also assume certain things like, oh, the average body, human body temperature is somewhere between 35 and 36.5 degrees. Uh, and, if any, and if the temperature is higher or lower than that, that's not normal body temperature. 
And those are some of the conclusions we can safely make after collecting enough data and using statistical procedures to help us make those conclusions. And we can make further conclusions about the population as well once we have that data from samples. And we'll talk more about that, the difference between sample and population. When we use statistical procedures, uh, we do so because we want to be accurate and meaningful in our interpretations about ourselves, about who we are and what we do, whether that's our grades or how we work, including our body temperature or how we sleep or how we study, or whether it's a business thing to figure out what people like and what people buy or psychology things like what makes us more healthy and what makes us less healthy. Again, using statistics based on concrete data would help us make accurate and meaningful interpretations. And in order to make those interpretations, we need a reliable way of doing this. So this means we need a standardized procedure for examining or evaluating this data. So imagine if we measure people differently each time. It would be like trying to build maybe a car or a phone with different parts for each phone. None of the phones would work or none of the cars would work if you have one design and you use different parts for it. Another example would be, for example, if a teacher says, oh, well, you need to do so and so things for this course and gives you syllabus in week one, but does not follow that syllabus in week two and gives you a totally different syllabus in week three, so there's no reliability there. The same can be said for statistics. We need a standardized and reliable procedure for us to do statistics so then we can examine our data in a consistent way. The first thing we look at when it comes to behavioral data is this idea of population versus sample. Populations and samples are different. As you may guess, one of these is bigger than the other. Take a moment to see which one is bigger. If you thought population is bigger than the sample, you are absolutely right. And because the population and samples are different, the data that you get from population is not going to be the same as your data that you get from your sample. So again, remember the people in the population, the population group is not the same as your sample group. The population group is usually much bigger, probably in the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, or even beyond. Samples are usually much smaller than that, maybe in the tens or hundreds, or sometimes thousands if they're very large samples. But the data that you get are different for population data and sample data. In a population, we are measuring everybody. So when you see population, think everyone, every single person in that specific category for a particular study. For example, if you wanted to know the population of, let's say, Psych 218 students, this would not only mean the Psych 218 in this class, but also it could mean the Psych 218 in other Psych 218 classes in this class, or even Psych 218 classes in the last term, or every Psych 218 ever in Alexander College which would not just be 35 students, but it could be 10s, 20s, or 30 times 35 students. So the population is much larger and we want to include everybody for a particular group of interest. That's a particular study. Like this says here, populations often very large and they also often vary in size depending on what we ask. In fact, because they're so large, especially in in the thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions, we cannot collect population data because we can't ask everybody. Instead, what we can do is ask a part or a sample of the population. So from the same population, we can ask a group of people from that population that we choose from. There is a word that we can describe how we choose the group of people fairly and 
without bias, and that's called random sampling, where everybody has an equal chance of being selected. You may remember this from your Site 217 class, 217, or any research methods class that you've taken in the past. No matter how the sample is selected, ideally selected from a random sample, there is one thing that you got to know. The sample sizes are much smaller, again, in your tens or hundreds or even thousands, but they are much smaller than the population as a whole. And because we're using samples and we want to be consistent, the sample size is going to be the same each time, or at least we try to do that. Therefore, it's more consistent. Remember, because we're grabbing the sample from the population, our sample data, when it's collected well using random sampling and we grab a sufficient large enough number, it should represent our population data at least. So here's an example. Let's say this was our Psych 218 for every single class that ever happened in Alexander College. And let's say this is very big, maybe in the range of, I'm making this number up, 35,000 people. Maybe there's a thousand of these classes. Uh, let's be a bit more realistic, 3,500 people. I'll change the comma here too. Maybe there's at least a hundred of these classes. And so if it was a research project done by a single person, there's no way we can ask all 3,500 students, especially since they're already uh, gone and they're studying something else, we can't ask them again. So we grab a sample. Here, a smaller sample. This is Psych 218 in this class. Okay, this is going to be spring. I can't spell spring. <laughs> spring 2020. 2020. Okay, and this has a much smaller number of 34 students. Okay, so as your instructor, I actually have this data right now. And I have taught other classes of this size. So another sample would be Psych 218, and it had the letter A in it, and that was last term, winter 2020. And I had another sample, Psych 218, and that was fall 2020. Those are just a few. And each one of these had 34 students. So the number itself is consistent. But they're much smaller. And there are other instructors that taught the same class. And one of the questions you might be asking is, well, how did people do in this class? Is, for example, is this class hard? And then you might say yes or no or maybe. And you might ask your colleagues, uh, your friends or classmates, like, hey, what'd you get in this class? Some might tell you 100% or, well, that's not likely. Maybe in the high 80, some might tell you 50%, some might give somewhere in between or a different number. And so if you ask enough people, you might start to get a better or more accurate answer to the question, is this class hard? And again, we're not asking everyone. If you go around and ask, you might ask maybe five, ten people in your past courses, or you might start asking people in this class, but there's not no data yet. So again, population is always larger than the sample, but at the same time, when we grab samples, we tend to have um, a more consistent sample size each time. So here's the relationship between population and sample. Again, looking at this slide, you can learn a few things. The population always asks about everybody, whatever you're interested in. For example, Psych 218 students, or Alexander College students, or Canadians, or international students. Whatever it is though, if that's your population, you have to ask everybody. But since we can't, often we grab a sample from that population. 
And so when we choose that sample, we use random sampling, ideally, under the scientific method, and ask them to participate. And once we measured something about them, asked the question, it could be like, hey, uh, how many hours are you sleeping? How many hours do you work? Uh, how much money are you spending? Whatever. Once you ask everybody the same question and got the same and got results from each one, then you could use the sample data to maybe make generalizations about the population. Again, because you can't ask everybody, you would use a sample, study them, and then make conclusions about the population. Okay, next slide. So now that we have distinguished between population and sample, the next thing we want to look at is variables and data. Think variable here as sort of the question we ask about people and the data is the answer that we get from about those questions. So for example, a variable could be your grade. It could be your hours of sleep. It could be the money you spend. It could be the number of courses you take. And those often come in the form of questions when we ask people about what they do. So the term for that is variable. You may remember this from your psychology class, whether it's 101, 102, or 217, research methods. Here, the slide describes variable as a characteristic or condition that changes. Again, remember, we're not the same people. Everyone's different, at least in some way. And because of that, the scores or the behavior changes from person to person. And sometimes it changes from time to time in the same person. And so we measure those things as variables. A characteristic or condition that has different values for different individuals. Take a moment and think. If everyone was the same, would we need to do statistics? If everyone got 50% in the class, is there any point to taking the class if, let's say, you wanted to do better than 50%? Or would you take the class automatically if all you wanted to do was pass? Again, if the score is the same for everybody, it doesn't change and it would no longer be a variable. Although, if we wanted to ask that, we would have to see that for real whether that's actually true or not. But as a whole, the definition of a variable is that it's a characteristic or condition that changes or has different values for different people. And when we measure the variables, we get data. Uh, using formal English, the singular form of data is datum, a single measurement about a variable. So it could be you maybe spend, I don't know, eight hours per day of sleeping, whereas somebody else could spend seven, another person could spend six, another person could spend five. Different people could have different measurements. And when we measure these people, we have a score for each person. And if we're just looking at those scores, we call those raw scores because we haven't done anything to change those scores or calculate them. Next, looking into data, this is the word you know. Uh, in formal English, data is actually plural when we look at multiple scores. Here, we say data as multiple measurements. Just like there are multiple students in a class, there are multiple measurements in a data set, which is this word here. So when we have a group of scores, we call that a data set and we need multiple scores in order to do statistics because again we are studying people and we assume people are different and they're going to have different scores and so we need to look at the whole data to give us a bigger picture of how people do when we ask them questions about what they do again it could be how you do in the class um, how many hours do you sleep what's your body temperature and so on So having distinguished between population and sample and variables and data, we can combine them 
and have two new terms. One is for the population and the other is for the sample. The first word here you see on the slide is parameters. Parameters. This word is for population data. So if you happen to be able to ask everybody or you start asking the population, you are actually trying to get population parameters. And when we describe population, um, we are using different symbols to, to label the values and such, and you will see those, and they're usually Greek letters. So for example, a population mean, and I'll use P-O-P -P apostrophe N here, mean means average, and we use the Greek letter mu, M-U. Uh, And for statistics, we are asking sample data. This includes calculations from the sample data. So, for example, if we want the sample mean, we don't use Greek letters, we use English letters. And those are your A, B, C, Ds, and so on. So, you can probably guess what letter we use for mean. Uh, there are two, actually. You can think of M as mean, or because we work with X's and Y's, and X being the dependent variable that we look at. The variable that we measure. So we are going to use the letter X. And X is for the raw score, but X bar, here is X bar, that's going to be for your mean. Again, we have two, two different sets of data. Population parameters and sample statistics. Notice here, this is probably the definition of statistics that you have heard in a number of places like the news or any sort of research or survey. When you think statistics as numbers, that's what statistics mean. It is a sample measurement, a sample score. That's a statistic. Um, statistic procedures itself, we call those statistics because that's how we do this research. That's how we analyze data. Now, in the field of statistics or in statistical procedures, there are two main types, two main ways of doing statistics. The first type mainly describe using sample data. And so we call this descriptive statistics. What that means is we gather a sample and we measure everybody in the sample and then we get scores from the sample. We can summarize the scores, you know, adding them all up or ranking them from lowest to highest. Um, looking at the most common score or the middle score if you rank them or adding them up and dividing it by the number of scores to get the average or the mean. And so we can summarize, organize, and simplify. So if you ever asked a question, let's say for a class, like, hey, what's the average for this class? You're doing descriptive statistics. Uh, if you are asking like, hey, what should I expect from this course? Is it hard? Well, you're asking about the average or the expected score and you are doing descriptive statistics. Or you could ask, hey, what's the highest score and the lowest score people can get in the class? Well, you're asking about the range, and that is also descriptive statistics. And so some of the ways we can do this is we use tables to organize the data, we can use graphs to show the data, and we can use certain mathematical formulas like average and mean, that's the mean, or the median, the middle score, or the mode, the most common score, or the range, and other techniques to describe the data. But what if you wanted to ask a more general question, not just about sample, but about the population? Then we make inferences and we use inferential statistics. We infer about the population using what we learn from the sample. So we need to analyze the sample data or we could compare between samples to generalize. 
about the sample that we get about the population. And we do this in several ways, and these are terms that you're going to learn later if you haven't already. We're going to make hypotheses. So for example, it could be like, oh, uh, if you ask a question, oh, is there a difference between taking statistics in Angus's class, uh, or is it going to be you know, harder or easier than and Andrea's class? Or if you know other instructors were teaching it, or if you're taking it from another college, or are they different or the same? Uh, the null hypothesis would hypothesize and suggest that no, they're no different as it should be. And we're going to test if that's true. Alpha is a term for a type 1 error. And we're going to learn what that is. It's the error that when we make in the decision that says, for example, oh, you know, uh, we, we, we asked some people and we thought, okay, uh, Angus, uh, the way Angus teaches this class and grade students is not the same as, let's say, uh, Andrea grades them. It could be easier or harder, but it turns out they're the same. The average is the same. It's not different enough for us to say, oh, one's easier or harder. But we decided to say there was based on the evidence we look at, and that's wrong. That's an error because it doesn't match the data. Uh, so that's one type of error. And to reject the null is to say, ah, the null hypothesis says, yes, different, but we say no. The null hypothesis says, no, different, but we say, yes, different. So again, those are some inferences that we could make about the population or when we compare samples based on sample data. Again, descriptive statistics is for mainly sample data, but we can do the same for population too. But for inferential statistics, we are inferring about the population using the sample. So I'm going to put this like that. So inferential statistics has two groups involved, the sample and the population. And we infer about the population using sample data. So when we get sample from populations, because we're not grabbing everybody, um, it will never be the same. The sample data will never be the same as population data. If the population was, let's say, 100 people, and you only ask even 99, that's not 100. It's close to 100, but it's not. It's not 100. It's still 99. You can ask the 99 people, you know, 99 times or more, but it's still not the same as 100. So the scores will be different. So that's the idea that, you know, a sample is never the same as the population. So for example, we'll do this real quickly, and even just the three numbers. One, two, three. You have person A, person B, and person C. If you ask everybody, that's the population, A, B, and C. And if you add them all up together, you can get an average of two. So, and this would be a population, by the way, so we use the Greek letter mu. And so, yeah, I mean, if the population was only three people and we ask everybody, we get everybody's data, one, two, and three from person A, B, and C. And so, yeah, we get a population mean of two. But let's say we can't ask everybody for some reason and we can only ask two, just one fewer. So, well, I could ask person one and two, but not C. So I could get a population mean here of... 1 plus 2 over 2, that's 3 over 2, that's 1.5. Well, I could also ask 1 and 3. Well, in this case, it'll be true just because the numbers match. But it's not like we're going to get this every time. And the last type we could ask is, oh, okay, well, 2 and 3. So we ask person B and C, and we get the result of 2.5. So you can see here, the sample is never the same as the population as soon as you even ask one person fewer than the population. That's a sample, not a population. And the data that you get is never the same as the population data, even if it's close. But remember, statistics themselves, it's not the same. Remember, yes, you get the same number two, but the way you get that mean the numbers themselves are different. The size is different. 
Population size here is 3, sample size is 2. The data themselves are not equal either. You have 1, 2, and 3 for the population, and 1 and 3 for the sample. So therefore, they are technically never identical. So therefore, this discrepancy, this amount of error, is called sample error. And this is what happens when we grab a sample from a population and start making calculations of it. So when we have the sample statistic, these guys, and we compare it with the population parameter here, there's a discrepancy. It's not the same. And that's called sampling error. So this next slide here shows you an example using pictures what the sampling error is. So as you can see here, with a more realistic situation, here's a college of a thousand students. Alexander has about two, three, maybe four times that size, maybe more with online studies. And if you grab only a sample of them, let's say here is five, you can compare the averages. The average IQ, for example, uh, for the population is 112.5. For one sample, the IQ average is much lower, 104.6. And then in another sample, the IQ average is slightly higher, 114.2. The sample that is used uh, has 65% female and 35% male. And for sample one, it has 60% female and 40% male. Sample two has 40% female and 60% male. Even their names are different. Even the average age is different. And so this is a way of showing that sampling error exists when we grab samples from populations. On the right is another slide that has a more detailed guide on how sampling works and the different types of errors you can get. Again, you grab a population of college students, again, probably in the thousands, and you grab samples here, they're samples of 15 each. Again, you notice the scores are different among the samples. And when we organize the data together, the distributions are different because the scores are different. That means the average scores are different. And we can ask some questions by, for example, comparing samples. And when we compare multiple samples, we are doing inferential statistics because we're making inferences about something that is larger than just one sample. It could be two samples, it could be comparing a sample with a population, but those can only be inferred because we're not asking everyone. And so we could say, oh, well, is there a difference between those two samples? Well, the data might suggest, oh, no, they're not far enough for us to say there is a difference between them because you know, we haven't asked everybody, and um, there could be individual differences that would account for what we see here. So those are some things you'll learn in this class later on in the weeks. But remember, when you grab a sample from a population, because you're not grabbing everyone, and the scores are not going to be the same as the population data, then you will have sampling error, and you'll have ways to account for this. So here's the first learning check. It's so the first question for you, and we'll end our first part. Question one. A researcher is interested in the effective amount of sleep on high school students. Well, it could be called a student's exam scores. A group of 75 high school boys or girls, um, or just high school students, agreed to participate in this study. The boys or girls or students are what? A, a statistic, B, a variable, C, a parameter, or D, a sample. You can pause and take a moment and think. So, remember, because we're looking at high school students and we only asked 75 of them, though that smaller group of high school students is a sample of the larger population group of high school students in general, and so the boys, in this case, as the question says, is a sample. Question two. Now, there are two questions here, actually, in the true-false. A. Most research studies use 
data from samples, true or false? And take a moment to think there. Write down your answer. Or B, when the sample data differs, is different from population data, there is a systematic difference between groups. That means whether there's a difference between one sample to another. Can we say that with just looking at the sample data? So here are the answers to our true and false questions. Yes, for A, it is true that most research studies use data from samples. Well, again, because the population is often too big for us to ask everybody. So that's uh, the way of asking that. Finally, for part B, when the sample data differs from the population data, there is a systematic difference between groups. Now, uh, if you don't know what systematic difference means yet, that's okay. You'll learn that later. Uh, but look at the word between groups. This is, think, this is asking about two samples. Uh, we don't have two samples. We're looking at one sample. That's the first thing. Second, um, when we talk about sampling error, this is for individual differences. And in the slide, it talks about random influences. That includes difference between individual scores. That is within the group. So let me show you this way. So again, remember, Systematic differences between groups could be, for example, if even I teach three classes so far in the picture we see here for Psych 218, that, oh, hey, if, if I teach one class differently from another class, that's not fair. Uh, that's a difference between groups. And nah, I shouldn't do that. Um, but in each class, there is some a difference between the students. Some students have done better and some students have done, you know, less than better or something. And, you know, there's a distribution of scores. Uh, the students that, you know, perform an average and others perform above or below average. So in each of these classes, you're going to get different scores uh, for each student. Again, if everybody got the same score and everybody passed, which is, is something that I get quite a lot from students. Hey, can you just pass everybody in the class? I mean, well, if everybody performs so well, then yeah, everybody gets to pass. But it depends on the student. And so regardless, because students are different and they perform in different levels, there are individual differences. And that's it for today. Uh, that's it for our part one in chapter one. Uh, again, keep going and use the resources in the class. Uh, do the learning checks and check your textbook and practice questions. And we'll see you in the next one.